This is 310, Related Rates, and our first and only objective for the section is to solve related rates problems. By the time we're done with all our examples, you should be able to explain why it's necessary to utilize the instantaneous information after you have taken a derivative. And all of these problems will be solved using the same steps. Our first step is to draw a diagram that is true for all time. When you're dealing with each of these problems, there will be components that are changing as time moves forward. So if a quantity or a dimension is changing, you must use a variable to represent it on the original picture. So we're going to label the diagram with all variables and constants that are involved. Once we've done that, we're going to use the relationships between the variables and the constants to write a single equation. Now that single equation needs to involve the variables that you know the rates for and the variables that you want the rates for. So any other variables will be extraneous and you want to find a way to eliminate them. Our third step is to differentiate both sides of the equation with respect to time. When we do step three, we'll, we, we will be creating rates of variables with respect to time. So we'll be talking about how those quantities or dimensions are changing over time. Once we have the relationship between the rates, thus the related rates label for these types of problems, we're going to go back to the diagram and update the labels with the instantaneous information. We do not plug the instantaneous information too soon because if we do, when we take the derivative, they will end up being constants who disappear. So we want to make sure that we reserve that moment that's frozen in time until after we've taken the derivatives. Lastly, we'll plug in everything we know from step 3. And if we've done steps 1 through 5 correctly, when we've done that, the only unknown that's remaining will be the rate that we want. So we'll finally solve for that unknown rate, and then we'll answer the question. And it's important that you remember to interpret the sign of your rate. On the AP exam, they will be asking you to interpret what that means. And if you don't do that properly, then you'll miss points. So let's look at our first example and go through those steps together. If we look at example one, we have a hot air balloon that's rising straight up from a level field and it's being tracked by a range finder that is 500 feet from the liftoff point. At the moment, the range finder's elevation angle is 45 degrees. The angle is increasing at a rate of 0.14 radians per minute and our job is to figure out how fast the balloon is rising at that moment. So step one, we're supposed to draw a diagram that is true for all time. And notice that I've done that. I have a balloon that is rising and I have a range finder that is not moving. So because it's not moving, this 500 feet is static. This distance, however, is changing over time because the balloon is moving up as time moves on. Now we were told that we know information about the rate at which the angle is increasing. So here's this angle. We have a rate for it, so we're going to make sure that we use that variable in our expressions and in our setup. So we're interested in this rate of change and we want or we have the rate of change for this. So our step two is to use what we know about this picture and these relationships to write a single equation. And hopefully you know enough about your right triangles to realize that this theta and the x that we want the rate for and the 500 are related with a trig relationship. So the tangent of the theta will be x over 500. So there's our step two. We have written a relationship between the thing we have the rate for and the thing we want the rate for. So our step three now is to take the derivative of both sides of this equation with respect to time. On the left hand side, when I take the derivative of tangent, I'll get a secant squared. If I take the derivative of the theta, I will get a d theta dt. On the right hand side, I can either do the quotient rule or I can think of this as a 1 over 500 times an x. So it's just a constant times x. So the derivative of that will be the constant times the derivative of x with respect to time. Notice that I now have an equation that involves the rates, so I'm ready to use the instantaneous information. So with step four, I go back to this picture and I label it with everything that happens at the instant. So at the instant, my angle is 45 degrees, which is the same as pi over four, and that means I have a 45, 45, 90 triangle, so x will also be 500. So with step four, I've now gotten x and theta 
and I'm ready to do step 5. With step 5, I'm going to plug in what I know into this equation from step 3. So I'll have secant squared of pi over 2, or excuse me, of pi over 4, and I will multiply by d theta dt, which is the rate at which that angle is changing. So I'll replace that with a 0.14. On the other side, I'll have a 1 over 500, and then a dx dt. Notice that the only variable remaining in this is the dx dt, which is the rate I'm looking for. So with step 6, I'm going to isolate that dx dt. So secant squared of pi over 4, remember that pi over 4 is a 45 degree angle whose unit circle coordinates are root 2 over 2, root 2 over 2, cosine is the x one, and cosine is the reciprocal of secant. So if I reciprocate this, I get a root 2, and when I square it, I get a 2. So the 2 times the 0.14, and then I'll move the 500 to the other side. Multiply that out, I get 1,000 times 0.14, which is 140. Think about the units. We've measured lengths in feet. So that's the change in the dx, and then the change in the time is measured in minutes. So I have 140 feet per minute equals dx dt. So now that I've solved for dx dt, I have to interpret, and I write down at the instant in question, the balloon is rising. at a rate of 140 feet per minute. So by using this word rising, I have communicated that the rate of change is a positive number, and so that distance is getting larger. With example two, we again have a right triangle set up. We have a police, police cruiser that's approaching a right angled intersection from the north, and he's chasing a speeding car that has turned the corner and is now moving straight east. When the cruiser is 0.6 miles north of the intersection and the car is 0.8 miles to the east, the police determine with a radar that the distance between them is increasing at 20 miles per hour. So if the cruiser is moving at 60 miles per hour at the instant of measurement, what is the speed of the car? So in this scenario, again, our step one is to draw a diagram that is true for all time. So I have our police cruiser that is heading south toward that intersection from the north. We have the speeding car that has turned the corner and is heading east. Our goal is to relate the thing we have the rate for, which is the distance between them and how it's changing, and we also know how fast the cruiser is going. So that means we're looking for a relationship between z and x and the rate at which the car is moving. So these three variables are going to be involved. So even though it's a right triangle, we aren't using any of the angles like we did in example one. Now we're just using the sides. So on step two, we need a relationship between all three sides, and that's our old Pythagorean theorem that we've used since geometry. If I now do step three, which is to take the derivative of this with, with respect to time, I'll get a 2x times a dx dt plus a 2y times a dy dt equals a 2z times a dz dt. Now with step four, I go back to the problem, and I fill in all the instantaneous information. So at the instant, I have the cruiser is 0.6 miles north, so this is going to be 0.6. And I've got the car, the speeding car, is 0.8 miles. So I can use the Pythagorean theorem and figure out that z is 1 mile. So now that I have that, I'm ready to go plug everything in in step five. So with step five, I'm going to replace the x with the 0.6, the dx dt with the speed of the car. So now a lot of people mess up with this right here, and the reason they mess up is they think of the speed as being the same as dx dt. We've got to keep in mind that dx dt represents the rate at which x is changing with respect to time. And as this police car gets closer and closer to the intersection, x is actually getting smaller, so it is 
decreasing. Because x is decreasing, we need to make sure that the rate at which x is changing is a negative number. If we look at y, that is going to end up being a positive number. So if we screw up in this process and we end up with a y being a negative number, we'll know that we did something wrong. Because as the car speeds forward, this y is getting larger. On the other side, we have our z, which is a 1.0. And then we have the dz dt, which is the rate at which the distance between them is increasing. So there's that 20 miles per hour, and it's positive because z is getting larger. Notice in step 5 now that the only remaining variable is the dy dt. So if I now solve for dy dt on my calculator, I will have dy dt equals that 2 times 1 times 20 minus a 2 times 0.6 times a negative 60 divided by a 2 times a 0.8, and I end up with 70 miles per hour. So to interpret this, the question is, if the cruiser is moving, what is the speed of the car? So we would write, at the instant in question, the speed of the car is 70 miles per hour. With example 3, we have two sides of a triangle that are 3 and 4 meters fixed, and the angle between them is increasing at a rate of 0 0.02 radians per second. Our goal is to find the rate at which the area of the triangle is increasing when the angle between the sides is a fixed length is a pi over 3. So if we look at what we were given, we were told information about the rate at which this angle between the two fixed sides is changing, and we're interested in the rate at which the area is changing. So that means with our step 2, we need to come up with an equation that relates the known information, the known rate, and the wanted rate. So we need the area in terms of that theta. So some of you have probably forgotten that areas of triangles are one half the base times the height. Well, actually, you haven't forgotten that, but you've forgotten how to get the height when you don't have it given, and it's not really a right triangle. So what we're going to do is we're going to think about the relationship between the height and the base and the angles and the sides that we know. So this angle here, I want to relate to this side and the hypotenuse of this right triangle. I can't really relate it to the 4, because the 4 extends beyond that right triangle. But I can certainly say that this height and this hypotenuse are related to theta using the sine. So I can say sine of the theta is the height over 3. So if I isolate the height here, I can replace height with 1 half times 4 times a 3 sine of theta. If I simplify that, I get the area is a 6 times the sine of theta. Now I have a relationship between the variable whose rate I want and the variable whose rate I know. So I'm ready to do step 3, which is to differentiate with respect to time. When I do that, I'll get a dA dt on the left. On the right, I'll move through the 6. I'll hit the sine leave the inside unchanged, and then do the derivative of the inside. Now that I have the relationship between the rates, I'm ready to go back to the triangle and label it with the instantaneous information. At the instant, my angle is pi over 3. So with step 5 now, oops, with step 5, I'm going to plug that in. So I'll have d a d t, which is what I want equals 6 times the cosine of pi over 3 times d theta dt, which was given to me as 0 0.02. Notice that dA dt is already isolated, so we just have to simplify what's written in order to solve for it. So if I simplify, I'll get dA dt equals 6 times the cosine of pi over 3, which is a half, times 0 0.02. This gives me a 3 times 0 0.02 is a 0 0.06. Now let's think about the units. We're measuring area when the lengths are in meters. So that's going to be a meter squared per changes in time. And the time in this problem is measured in seconds. So I can interpret these results by saying, at the instant in question, the area is increasing we say that it's increasing because that rate is positive at a rate 
of 0 0.06 meters squared per second. With example 4, we have a point moving on the hyperbola, and the equation is given to me so that its y-coordinate is increasing at a constant rate of 4 units per second, and the question is how fast is the x-coordinate changing? Now what's fortunate about this problem is that we already have the relationship, so step 2 is already done for us. We have 3x squared minus y squared equals 23. With step 3, we just take the derivative with respect to time. So that would be a 3 times a 2x times a dx dt minus a 2 times a y times a dy dt equals 0. Now I have a relationship between the rate at which x is changing and the rate at which y is changing. With step 4, I go back to my picture and I label it with the instantaneous information. So we were told the y coordinate is increasing at a constant rate and we wanted to know how fast the x is changing when x is 4. So when x is 4, notice that we have two different y coordinates that I could have. So when x is 4, we'll have a 3 times a 16 minus a y squared equals a 23. So that means a negative y squared equals a 23 minus a 48, that's a negative 25. So y will be plus or minus 5. So we have two different scenarios going on with step 5. So with step 5 we can plug in x is 4. We want dx dt. We want y, we'll do the positive one first, and we know dy dt is 4. So there's our first equation involving dx dt. Or we can have the other variation, which is 3 times 2 times 4 dx dt minus a 2 times a negative 5 times 4. On this one, if I isolate dx dt, I end up with a 2 times a 5 times a 4 over a 3 times a 2 times a 4. So the 4's cancel, the 2's cancel, and I'm left with a positive 5 thirds units per second. And my other option will just be the opposite of that. So that was step 6 where we isolated and now we need to interpret. So at the instant in question, if the particle is at the point 4 comma 5, the x coordinate is, so here was the positive 5 plugged in, we're increasing, is increasing because we have a positive rate at a rate of 5 thirds units per second. If, on the other hand, the particle is at 4 negative 5, the x coordinate is decreasing at a rate of negative 5 thirds. So let's look at why that makes sense. If y is increasing the whole time, if we're here and y is getting bigger, then the x is also moving to the right, so it's getting larger. Here, if we're trapped on that, that hyperbola and y is getting bigger, then the x is going to be moving further left, and so the x coordinate will be getting smaller. With example 5, we have two carts that are connected by a rope 40 feet long that passes over a pulley. This point Q is 17 feet directly beneath and between the carts, so that is not going to change. So we can label it with a number. We also have the length of the rope is not going to change, but we have that rope creating two different pieces of a triangle. So we could let this piece be an X, and then this piece would be a 40 minus X, because the entire length needs to be 40. Now we have cart A is being pulled away from Q at a speed of 2 feet per second. So we could label this distance Y going from Q to cart A. And then the question is how fast is cart B moving toward Q? So if we look at that, we have another distance here that is the distance from B to Q. We can label that Z.
Now we know the rate at which y is changing and we want the rate at which z is changing. So our goal in this process for step two is to come up with a single equation that relates y and z. So for step two, we're going to be writing down first the relationships that we know. Since p is directly above q, we can get this right triangle and we can see that these three sides will be related using Pythagorean theorem. So y squared plus 17 squared will have to equal x squared. By the same token, on the other triangle, we will have z squared plus 17 squared equals 40 minus x squared. Now we don't want to have x involved because we aren't interested in the rate at which x is changing, nor do we have any um, information about when it's changing. So instead, we want to get rid of this x or else rid of this x, and it doesn't really matter which. So what I'm going to do is solve for x in this one since it's not attached to as much stuff, and we'll get x equals either the positive or negative square root of y squared plus 17 squared. Since x is representing a length, I'm going to use the positive root. That means over with this equation, we'll have z squared plus 17 squared equals a 40 minus this root, y squared plus 17 squared, all squared. Now I have a relationship between the rate that I want, or the variable whose rate I want, and the variable whose rate I have. So I'm in a position now to differentiate. So step three is to differentiate with respect to time this entire equation. So I'll get a 2z dz dt. The 17 is a constant, so that'll disappear. Over here, we see that we need to do the chain rule. So we'll bring the 2 down in front. And that'll be raised to the 1. And then we need to multiply by the derivative of the inside, which will be a 0 minus a 1 half of that y squared plus 17 squared to the negative 1 half times the derivative of the innermost inside, which is that 2y. So the derivative of that will be a 2y dy dt. So if we look now, we have a relationship between dz dt and dy dt, which is what we wanted. So now we're ready to do step four, which is to go back to the picture and label it with everything that we know at the instant in time. So at the instant in time, cart A is six feet from Q, so we know y is six. We could do Pythagorean theorem and figure out that x is now going to be a five root 13. And since x is a five root 13, that means this distance here will be a 40 minus a five root 13. So then we can do Pythagorean theorem with this number and with the 17 to determine that z equals root, and this is kind of messy, and I'll just trust you to do it on your calculator, 409 minus 100 root 13. So kind of messy, but still a number, and we were able to find it. So with step five now, we're going to plug everything in. We'll have two times this nasty radical, dz dt, equals 2 times 40 minus, there's y, which is a 6, times a negative 1 half, times another 6 squared plus 17 squared to the negative 1 half, times a 2, times a 6, times a dy dt. So we have information about how cart A is being pulled away from Q at a speed of 2 feet per second. So that means this distance is getting larger as time goes on, because A is being pulled away. So that dy dt is going to be a positive 2. Now our goal in step 6 is to isolate dz dt. So dz dt will equal all of this stuff on top divided by this. So if you put that into your calculator, you end up with a negative 1.05. And the units will be in feet per second. Now to interpret it, the question is we want to answer the question, how fast is the cart B moving 
toward Q. Well, if we think about B moving toward Q, that means Z is shrinking. That means Z is getting smaller, so its rate is negative. So we would say at the instant in question, cart B is moving toward Q at a rate of 1.05 feet per second. With our final example, example 6, we have water running into a conical tank at a rate of 9 feet cubed per minute. So that is actually information about the rate in the change of the volume. And the question is, how fast is the water level rising when the water is 6 feet deep? So we want dy dt and we have dv dt. So that means with our step 2, we want to find a relationship between the volume and why. So to do that, we're going to write what we know about the volume of a cone. The volume of a cone, if you remember from your geometry classes, is one-third a pi r squared times the height. So in this particular case, we're interested in the volume of the water, which is this thing. So we're going to have the volume equals one-third the pi times the radius, which is x, times the height, which is y. Now the problem with this is that we don't want to have x in there. We're only interested in the rate who, or the variable whose rate we have and the variable whose rate we want. So we've got to use some other relationships to help us get rid of this x. So we'll go back and look at the big cone versus the little cone and realize that they are similar shapes. And if they're similar, that means that the ratios of their dimensions have to equal each other. So that means 5 would be to x just like 10 would be to y. If I cross multiply now, then I can see that x is actually 1 half of y. And I can replace that x over here and get v equals 1 third pi times 1 half y squared times y. Now remember that we now have a, an equation that involves the volume, whose rate we have, and the height, whose rate we want. And we are going to differentiate. The issue with differentiation is that we always have a choice. We can simplify first and then take the derivative, or we can take the derivative and then simplify. And it's almost always easier to simplify first. So I'm going to do that before I take the derivative. I'm going to realize that a 1 half when I square it is a 1 fourth, and then I have times a 1 third times that constant pi. So I get a pi over 12 times a y cubed. And this will be much easier to take the derivative of than this one. So in step 3, I'll now take the derivative with respect to time and get dv dt equals, move through the constant, hit the power, and then hit the y. Now I have a relationship between the rate at which the volume is changing and the rate at which the height of the water, or the water level. And I'm ready to do step four, which is how fast is the water level rising when the water is six? So I'm going to go back and put in a y is six and an x is a three. And that's really all we need. So with step five now, I'm going to plug in what we know. Water's coming into the conical tank. That means dv dt is a positive number. And we know y at the instant is six and dy dt is what we want. So with step 6, I'm going to solve for dy dt, which means I'll divide that 9 by the pi over 12, and I'll divide by the 3 and the 6 squared. If I simplify all of that, I can see that I've got one of these 6's goes into 12 two times, 3 goes into 9 three times, 6 goes and 3, I'll have a 2 left over, and then these 2's will cancel. So it looks like I end up with a 1 over a pi. The units for y will be measured in feet, and then the rate for the time involved is going to be per minute. Now notice that this is a positive number, which makes sense because the water level is rising. So for our interpretation, we would say, at the instant in question, the water level is rising at a rate of 1 over pi feet per minute.